Where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevails, and where any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. Frederick Douglass. If you've been paying any attention to politics lately, which for the sake of your mental health, I can't really suggest that you do, then you might have noticed that things have taken a turn for the conspiratorial. On the one hand, you've recently had Democrats going on their cork boards to explain the connections between President Trump, Vladimir Putin, and Paul Manafort's $10,000 rug collection. On the other side, you've got some seriously unwell individuals who voted for Trump and for some reason believe that the Clintons are doing satanic pedophilia in the basement of a D.C. pizza shop. And none of this conspiracy mongering was helped by the recent quote-unquote suicide of one well-connected billionaire pedophile sex trafficker, Mr. Jeffrey Epstein. While it may seem that the country is sliding headfirst into a big collective tinfoil hat, I have the sad duty of relaying to you that, in fact, this country has never not been wearing a tinfoil hat. And, in fact, conspiracy has been integral to American politics since we've had American politics. Today, we're going to talk about an early American conspiracy theory and its particularly strong roots in Vermont, of all places. You've probably heard of the Freemasons, a secret society, a lot of founding fathers were members, and it was explored in depth in the documentary National Treasure 2. Essentially, it wasn't more than a few secret rituals that were kind of connected to the Bible, and it was mostly a networking organization that helped members get jobs and political offices. It's basically an 18th century LinkedIn, and frankly, it's not that different from a frat, but for adults. Large portions of early America's most powerful people, judges, senators, presidents, bankers, a lot of them were Masons. They were basically the elite 1%. Conspiracy theories about the group are absolutely wild, but they definitely hit their peak around 1826, when former Mason William Morgan died under suspicious circumstances in upstate New York. Morgan had left the organization because no other Masons would sit with him at the table at the lodge, and so he wrote a book called The Illustrations of Masonry, a book that leaked the organization's secrets, their rituals, their questions to prove that you're a Mason. There's a link to the book, rather, in the description of this video. Check it out, it's really not that much. Unfortunately, a secret society doesn't take too well to having its secrets revealed, and Morgan's print shop was burned down, and then he was arrested on multiple occasions on trumped-up charges of false debts. And he was tried by a judge who happened to be a Mason and then put in a debtor's prison. During transportation from one of those prisons, he was taken to the Niagara Falls region by carriage. And he was never seen again. From this suspicious death came America's first real organized third party, the Anti-Masonic Party. While Andrew Jackson's Democrats had been extending voting rights to white men, but who didn't own land, the Anti-Masonic Party was kind of similarly populist, taking aim at elites who were all members of this secret club, a feeling that one could not be both loyal to the United States and to the Masons. They referred to the Masons as a, quote, great serpent who worked to subvert freedom of the press and was tied 
to the Illuminati, which was a real organization founded in 1776 in Austria. They're basically like the Masons. They just drank. The Anti-Masonic Party organized itself in 1828 in upstate New York, contemporary to the religious revivals of the Second Great Awakening, many of which saw the Masons as anti-Christian. The party drew big names in politics, including former President John Quincy Adams and future presidents William Henry Harrison and Millard Fillmore. Not to mention famous non-presidents such as Thaddeus Stevens and William Seward. William Seward, by the way, would be Lincoln's Secretary of State and would forever be known as that weird guy who bought a bunch of ice near Russia. The Anti-Masonic Party had a particularly strong presence in upstate New York, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, and it was probably the strongest in the state of Vermont. The Anti-Masons of Vermont were so popular that they won the governorship not once, but twice. First, with UVM alumnus, former and former senator, William Palmer in 1831, and then again in 1835 with Silas Jennison. Pennsylvania was the only other state to elect an anti-Mason to the governorship, but they only did it once. Scarcely little information is known about Vermont's governor, Jennison, but we do know about William Palmer is that, as governor, he largely refused to nominate any Freemasons to judgeships or as sheriffs or any other government employees, and also managed to revoke the charter of Vermont's head Masonic Lodge. Additionally, Vermont elected an anti-Mason to the U.S. House of Representatives, not once, not twice, but on four separate occasions. In the year 1832, there were presidential elections, and the Anti-Masonic Party convened in Albany to nominate their candidate, William Wirt. Now, William Wirt had been a Mason, but he had since denounced it and ran on the Anti-Masonic Party platform. This is significant because this was the first time in history that a party chose its presidential candidate not by secret ballot or in a closed room, but by an open party convention with delegates. It's the system that we still use today. When the election rolled around, William Wirt came in fourth place. He had seven electoral votes and won exactly one state. I'll give you five seconds to guess which state that was. So why did this Masonic conspiracy theory thrive in Vermont of all places? I don't really know. I'm kind of a dumb guy, so let's consult a smart guy who actually knows things. After having been the fastest growing state at the turn of the century, in the 1830s, Vermont's population increased a meager 4%. Without the old boom psychology for support during this turbulent decade, Vermonters coped with chronic cholera epidemics and severe economic dislocations. The social fabric clearly reflected the strain as the society desperately sought outlets and flocked to a variety of movements. In politics, they rejected the traditional parties of Adams and Henry Clay, or Jackson and Van Buren, for the social nostrums of the anti-Mason candidates. So, basically, things in Vermont weren't going exceptionally well, and, well, damn it, it had to be somebody's fault. And, hey, there's a lot of people who are supposed to be in charge, and they all belong to this one club. Maybe if we get rid of this club, things will get better. At least that's what the anti-Masons thought. The party began to dissolve in the late 1830s, as most members either flocked to the newly formed Whig Party, which would then go on to become the Republican Party, who picked up on anti-Mason's other goals, like support for public road projects and protective tariffs. The party would never reach its original power, although it experienced a brief resurgence in 1880, where it ran former Vermont Senator and Civil War General J.W. Phelps for president. He won a whopping 1,035 votes, almost all from Vermonters. 
the biggest lesson that we can take away from this whole Masonic thing is about the nature of third parties in America. Even when they're successful, like the anti-Masonic party kind of was, they can't last long. Because once it has enough voters to impact the result of an election, one of the two main parties is going to want that block of voters for themselves. And so they'll change their platform to incorporate the third party's ideas into it. You saw this in 1968 when George Wallace's racist segregation campaign won 45 electoral votes and pushed Richard Nixon and the Republicans to do more racism in their Southern strategy. You also saw this in 2016, and no one seems to remember this, but Jill Stein and the Green Party ran on a federal jobs and climate initiative called the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is now the centerpiece of the entire 2020 presidential campaign for the Democrats. It's entirely mainstream now, but does the Green, but does the Green Party get any credit? No, of course they don't. They just get yelled at on Twitter for being the reason that Hillary Clinton lost, even though if you look at the data, in Detroit, over 90,000 people... I'm, I'm getting mad online, and that's just not acceptable. What I'm trying to say is that conspiracy theories can get mainstreamed when things suck and people start looking for somebody to blame when people's day-to-day -day living conditions are so bad that they look for somebody to give them a narrative, a story that explains good guys and bad guys, that tells them why their life sucks, whether those bad guys are the deep state or the Russians and their compromat or the millionaires and billionaires or if they're the Freemasons. If you want to succeed in politics, you need to tell your voters a good story. Whether it's true or not makes absolutely no difference as long as people feel it's true. Thanks for watching.